It's time for In the Money, stock market action on AMA 20 News. Here's Chief Market Strategist Gareth Sotaway from InTheMoneyStocks.com. Good afternoon, everybody. Hope everyone's doing well today. So great to be with you here on this Sunday edition of In the Money Stock Market Action. My name is Gareth Soloway, Chief Market Strategist at InTheMoneyStocks.com. So interesting week in the markets, all right? So we just got through some pretty wild action on Thursday and a little bit of a down day on Friday. And the question has to be asked, what does it mean? I mean, what does it tell us about the future of this market? And again, you guys know last week we had a, a great interview with Martin Armstrong uh, as well as my business partner chief market strategist Nicholas Santiago and he was talking about how the markets were setting up for a pretty nice decline where we should be topping out based on the dollar yen topping out and the dollar yen I mean most average investors would have no idea what that means I'm not going to get into detail but ultimately it's when you're dealing with currencies you start looking at money flow and we're talking about trillions and trillions of dollars here and ultimately we saw a week and a half ago, the dollar yen hit its max move to the upside, and the markets get this, guys. The markets trade tick for tick with the dollar yen, basically. All right, during the day, if the dollar yen pops up a little bit, the markets pop up. If the dollar yen starts to fall, the markets will fall. And anytime you hit a max move to the upside, it indicates that uh, that currency or that commodity or that stock or market will start to pull back. And sure enough, last week on Thursday, the dollar yen began to collapse. And guess what that meant for the markets? Downside action. So we saw the markets collapsing on Thursday. Earlier before that, we saw some whippy action. We're going to get into all of that today. We also have a very special interview a little bit later with Patrick Byrne, who is the CEO of Overstock.com. And he's going to tell us all about his views on the market, what he thinks of the Federal Reserve, what he thinks about the economy, how to invest and how to kind of stay focused on making money and being prepared for what is to come. It's truly an epic interview. I sat down with him uh, last week and just discussed a few key things things and I have to share them with you. It really is eye-opening, and again, it kind of goes back to some of the guests we've been bringing to you, uh, like G. Edward Griffin and uh, uh, Martin Armstrong as well. So again, getting into today's action, folks, I want to go over, obviously, what happened last week in the markets. We basically nailed it on a home run basis here last week. I gave you guys five calls, uh, five alerts, five trades, essentially, last Sunday. All of them made significant amounts of money. In fact, total money made an average of 3.4% per trade. That's in five trading days, or if you expand that out to a yearly basis, over 150% gain year over year. Now, we'll get into those plays specifically, and I'm going to give out new trade alerts as I always do, but what I first want to do is go over market action last week. I want to get you guys to understand what Wall Street's not telling you. All right, Because remember, Wall Street isn't out there just telling you the truth. They're not going to be laying it up for you like a slow-pitch softball underhand pass or anything like that. All right, They're going to be throwing curveballs at you because they want you to be on the wrong side. That's the only way they're going to make money. So you have to remember that the game is being played here. And I'm not going to get into the game much today because we have a lot to discuss. But always remember, it's a transfer of wealth. That is what the markets are. All right, It's from the people that know what they're doing in the markets – and get in at the right times from, and they're taking money from, the people that have no clue. And honestly, the average investor who works a nine-to-five job, how are they supposed to have a clue? I mean, overall, they work hard. They're not focused on the markets. They have other things on their mind, like family and children and so forth. So they're not going to have an idea. Therefore, the transfer of wealth comes from the average investor to generally the hedge funds and institutions on Wall Street. Now, the media plays right into that as the institutions push agendas, the media picks up and talks about it on the news, and they kind of contribute to that uh, rollover of assets. Now, I'm here to be that outshining uh, kind of um, star for you guys to try to tell you exactly what the truth is behind Wall Street. All right, what the truth is of the market coming up. And that's what I really want this show to be all about and what I've tried to strive for in the previous shows since we began in uh, the beginning of January 14. Now, again, going over last week, let's get right into it because I thought last week was a fascinating, action-packed week. We started out on Monday, right? So Monday, initially, we came into the week after some really ugly Chinese economic news. And this is what's so scary to me, folks, is that the world is crumbling around us, and the markets, for the most part, have ignored it. All right, going into Monday, the markets were basically sitting at all-time highs. 
And even on Monday, the market saw some selling early, sure. We opened up and we sold off, coming back in, and we sold you know, you know, 50 points on the Dow or so, nothing major. And then all of a sudden, the market's got the buy-the-dip mentality one more time. And again, this is tied to the dollar-yen, but it's exaggerated by the small investor putting money into the markets. All right, because again, the mentality of the average investor is, oh, the markets just won't go down, therefore it's easy money. Anytime you think something's easy money, folks, honestly, it's not. In fact, it's the opposite. It's going to get taken from you. Always remember that. There's no such thing as an easy trade or a no-brainer trade. All right, now, once you learn how to read the charts, then things become clear. But even then, I mean, no one's 100%. I'm definitely not. I might hit you know, 80% winners for the most part, which is better than hedge funds do out there, and I'm giving you guys that information. But I'm not 100%, and I'll be the first to admit it. All right, in any case, Monday, we saw the markets initially weak on the Chinese economic data. Remember, exports out of China down 18% year over year. I mean, we're talking about the, imagine if all of a sudden, year over year, the exports of the U.S. Or, or whatever metric in the U.S. economically was down 18%. I mean, that is humongous. And the market still recovered. And Tuesday, we saw the markets push up early, nearing the highs from the previous week. Couldn't quite get there. And that might have been the first inkling of a major crack in the glass or in the ice as the markets again just couldn't get back to those all-time highs from the previous week on Tuesday and the market started to sell off Wednesday we had a gap down but again the markets reversed and struggled back to close on the flat line so basically Monday Tuesday Wednesday you had some intraday volatility but the markets ended flat they just couldn't break down come Thursday Thursday is where it all began why? Well, we know all the issues with Russia, Ukraine, the Crimea situation. And by the way, that's going to be a continued uh, kind of curse for the markets this week as we watch to see what sanctions are put on Russia and how it affects and the kind of the back and forth. But the markets finally got that breakdown on Friday. After gapping up, and a gap up means they opened up higher, the markets began to decline in epic fashion. Selling, 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 selling we haven't seen really since the end of January, early February on any one single day. And what's amazing about this is that one thing I was telling my radio audience, you guys that are listening on my radio spots at around 8.40 a.m. Monday through Friday and 5.53 p.m. Monday through Friday on 8.20 a.m. News Talk Radio, I was saying what we need to see to confirm a top here is confirmation. What is confirmation? Let's discuss it quickly. Confirmation is where the markets have a significant down day followed by another down day where you close lower – than the previous lows. So basically what we need to do on Friday to confirm that a top is in is close below the lows from Thursday. And sure enough, the S&P did that. So to me, this looks like a top. Now, I want to be clear on this because there are a lot of investors out there who, again, are not going to be sure what I'm saying here. And I want to be crystal clear. All right? When the market confirms to the downside, it means that generally the top is in. It doesn't mean every single day is going to be down. Nothing goes straight down. Nothing goes straight up. But what, again, it means is that generally now we should start to trail down. Again, we had a major cycle pivot, and my partner, Chief Market Strategist Nicholas Santiago, gave this out to our members literally a month ago that around mid-March we'd see a pivot top. And sure enough, that means downside continuing. But remember, you're going to have buy-the-dip mentality out there because you're going to hear the media spouting like, oh, we got our 5% correction, or oh, we got our 10% correction. I guess we should buy now, right? Well, Sure, if you're a short-term trader like we are at InTheMoneyStocks.com, you can absolutely play that. We did that in January. We were short in early January, and we bought in early February. And we wrote it up, and then we sold, and now we've gotten short again on the markets. And we just play you know, ping-pong with the markets, essentially, just making exponential money. And that's what I want to relay to you guys is to not be that long-term brainwashed investor. Uh, You've got to manage your money like it's your money. And that's the crazy thing about it. And I always, I always joke about this, and it's, it's half-joking, but it's half-sad, that – the average investor is so kind of lax about their investments. Yeah, you know, whatever, I'm a long-term investor. You know, you're dealing with your own money here. How about taking a little bit more interest in learning? I mean, you, you, when you're working at your job and you're making 50000 a year, seventy five a year, whatever you're making, you, know, you take a pretty darn good interest because you don't want to get fired. And then your 401K has, you know, by retirement, quarter million in it, maybe more, hopefully more. And why wouldn't you be more into that? Because in theory, you could make as much, you know, 50000 a year, on your 401k, you should be just as interested as if it was your job. And it's your money, your hard-earned money, your blood, sweat, all that into that. So make sure you guys start paying attention to the markets and just paying attention to what truly works and ignoring it. And I don't mean pay attention to, like, the, the media out there, the Kramers out there, all right? You've got to pay attention to the truth. 
focus in on that truth, okay? So that's what we have going on here, folks. What I want to do now is just briefly take a break. All right, we're going to step aside here because I want to come back and get into the plays from last week. We're going to go into next week's plays, and I want to focus in again on us making money in the coming week because that's what it comes down to. All right, I want to help every, each and every one of you guys make money. So uh, my name again, Gareth Soloway, Chief Market Strategist at InTheMoneyStocks.com, and this is In The Money Stock Market Action on 820 AM News Talk Radio. Now back to In The Money Stock Market Action on AMA 20 News. Here's Gareth Soloway. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome, and uh, great to be with you all again on this Sunday. I love getting in here on Sunday and talking about the markets and setting everyone up for the coming week, especially because we're kind of in that shorter-term view on the markets, like this long-term investing nonsense. Let let the people who, who kind of don't know what they're doing continue to do that if they want to. I'm here to inform and educate so you can be in the realm of kind of making money consistently and more money. And I always say this, folks, but if you look at the charts, right, if you look at the chart of the S&P 500, and if you could just be long or short the market on the up moves, be long. When it pulls back, be short, then go long again. I mean, obviously, you're never going to nail it 100% on the tops and the lows, but by reading the charts, you can get pretty darn close. You can make literally hundreds of percentage points a year, in my opinion. All right. I mean, I, I think if you look at our, our track record from 2013 at InTheMoneyStocks.com, which is documented and time-stamped, uh, we came across with about 500% return net. Now, granted, you never put all of your money in one position, but even if you put just 10% of your money in each position, you're still walking away with 50% return for the year. And that's just kind of being long and short. And granted, last week, last year, the markets didn't even give us a chance to really go short that much. So, I mean, it was even poorer uh, action than we would have preferred. This year should be much, much better. You're going to get the volatility. You're going to get your up and down swings back and forth. And that's really what we want to do. So. I want to get into one thing right here. First of all, I want to give a special shout out to uh, Bob Johnson out there. He's a member of ours, and he wrote to me this week. He said, hi, Gareth. I will make a donation to the charity of your choosing when you are ready. I can donate by credit card, whatever is easiest. Just let me know. Thanks for all you do for us. So, again, you guys know I always try to get you guys to, as you make money, give a little back. And sure enough, um, Mr. Johnson is doing just that. And, again, I appreciate it. And last week, and this is crazy, guys, so i, I got to talk about it just a bit, number one, we confirmed to the downside. Uh, and I want to just make this one last thing clear before we get into the trades from last week. But this market, it does have the possibility to be a crash scenario. All right. Now, I'm not saying this is going to happen in the coming weeks. It'll probably happen when we all least expect it. But based on where things are, if something goes and bubbles over, for instance, the Russian situation, I mean, if, if you know, hopefully it doesn't happen, but if something really goes wrong there, or if something collapses in terms of the dollar yen and you have a crash in the dollar yen, I mean, you could literally see an a thousand point a thousand point drop very easily on the Dow Jones industrial average. So again, my angle is this. I think that even if the markets bounce back a little bit, your upside risk is one, two percent upside risk. I mean, that's if everything all of a sudden starts to look hunky-dory. The markets can maybe go up one, two, maybe three percent. Downside, you're looking at a 10 percent pullback from the highs. All right, we're already off the highs a couple percent, so there's may maybe an eight more percent uh, angle to the downside with always that chance of a crash out there. And at that point, once we hit key supports, and I'll give you some supports on some stocks in a little while, I will be looking to buy. But again, thank you to Mr. Johnson for uh, the donation. And again, guys, if you're making money, which again, if you took any of the plays last week, you sure did, then make sure you give a little bit back. All right, now going to last week's pick, so the, the prior week, I was off on each one of those, but I was off small. And this is the key. I was looking for the market to roll over, which it did this past week, and I was correct on that. It didn't happen the previous week, so I donated $500 to charity. And again, at the end of this month, that'll be the end of the quarter, I will be donating or giving that check over to the Metropolitan Ministries of Tampa. And I look forward to doing that. Uh, and again, so down 1% on average last week. This week, 3.44% gain, and I'm looking for more gains in the coming week. So number one, let's talk a little bit of action. Last week, we gave out long SDS at $28.29. It ran and closed on Friday to $29.37, a $1.8 gain or 3.82%. Long QID at $55.43. It went up to 57.70. That's a two dollar and 27 cent gain in one week, or 4.1 percent. Short Facebook, 69 dollars and 80 cents short. It went to 67.72. That's a two dollar and eight cent gain, or 2.98 percent. 
And AXP short, 93.86 on the short side, and it closed on Friday to 90.17. It's a $3.69 gain or 3.93% gain. And the other one, the last one was short DuPont. And that's DD symbol and shorted it at 67.24 and it closed at 65.77 or a dollar 47 gain 2.19 percent. So really good action there, guys. And again, just in a little while, we'll get into the other factors um, for this coming week's picks. But before I do that, I want to talk about a couple plays from last week. The big trades of the week for myself. And number one, we have to talk a little bit about CNTF. Now, I didn't take this trade myself, but I wanted to bring it to your attention because a lot of people were asking me about what was going on here with this stock. All right. In fact, I was getting a caller to call up a couple weeks in a row and saying, oh, you know, I keep on hearing CNTF is going to be the next Apple. And the last time a couple weeks ago that he called up, we said, listen, the chart is showing us major weakness here. Stay away. You know, never believe, and this is a good lesson, and the reason I'm bringing it up is because it's a trade lesson. Never believe in the hype, all right? You could hear that something's going to be the next Apple or the, they're going to cure cancer or whatever. Don't believe it, guys. Thousands of companies you'll hear that on. Maybe in the next 30 years, one company will actually do it. The odds of you hitting that company correctly, one in a million, and you can make so much more money. Even if you were in that stock, you'd still make more by investing in other stocks that have good charts than you would by just sitting and holding that one for the next 10 years. So ignore that hype. That is hype that's going to get you on the wrong side of the trade. And the reason I bring this up is because we talked about, you know, getting out of it. Take your profits and run. I don't like it anymore, I said on CNTF. And what did the stock do this past week? From the highs, get this. From the highs, the stock hit $3 and has dropped 40% in a couple of weeks. 40%, guys. Now, it, maybe the stock's still going to be the next Apple. For all I know, who know, who cares, right? But the point is... When a stock tells you to sell based on looking at the chart, you sell. That's just that simple. Never fall in love with a stock. Never marry a stock. You want to use them. They're vehicles for you to profit. That is it. I don't care if it's Apple. I don't care if it's Google. I don't care if it's J.P. Morgan Chase Company. You use them to profit, and you get rid of them when the profit is not in your favor anymore, when it's telling you it's going to go the opposite way. Now, in all fairness, I might like CNTF again. In fact, check this out. The high-risk buy level is $1.55. It's right now trading at $1.83 per the close on Friday. It gets to $1.55. It actually looks decent again. Okay, so now it starts to look attractive. So, you know, then you can look at, you know, again, it's a high-risk play. It's a China play, obviously, in a bad market. It has a lot of trouble, but that would be the level. And by doing this type of maneuvering, by buying low and selling high and just rinsing and repeating it, you can make so much money out there. So much money. And the beauty of it is you stay away from losing the money. Okay? All right. So, I mean, I think that's the key. All right, guys. I want to go on to another trade here as we kind of come into the final couple minutes before we're going to get into this interview. And one of them was Plug. Plug Power made a lot of money this week. This stock had an epic run-up. And, again, the same thing applies as with CNTF. We saw the stock pulling back pretty dramatically. All right? I was short with the members here. And in the moneystocks.com. And the beauty of it is we had someone from the Citron Report, the head of Citron, which is like a notoriously short, um, biased um, website. He came on the air on CNBC and was touting how horrible a stock it was. The stock just collapsed. What did I do? I mean, when you hear someone bashing a stock, right? Well, obviously, he's short, so he wants it to go down. Now, don't ask me how ethically that, that works out where you can pump that on TV. But in any case, the point is when the stock came down hard, what did I do? I bought it. I bought it. All right, this is how you ignore the hype. Ignore it. Go the opposite way. All right, now you got to look at the charts and find out at what level is the proper level. But if everyone's hating on something, just like a J.C. Penny, that's my quarterly play, right? J.C. Penny, let me bring that chart up. Okay, J.C. Penny, guys, check this out. I gave this to you guys at the beginning of January, and I said, this is my quarterly play. I think it's going to do better. I think everyone hates it right now. The stock initially went all the way down to $5. Now it's up and trading at $8.75. We're in the money like 15 20% at this point. When everyone hates it, think about buying it. Remember that. All right, guys, I'm going to give you plays as we get into the, the end of this little first half segment. I want to get into some plays out there for next week. And, again, we're going to stick with Facebook on the short side. All right, we're going to take Friday's close. So even though we made a bunch of money, all right, last week we made – Two dollars and eight cents on it short. We're going to get rid of that, and we're going to take the closing price. And I'm saying again that based on Friday's closing price, I think it's going to end lower this Friday. So short Facebook sixty-seven seventy-two. 
All right, short GLD. Now, this is gold. GLD is gold. So I'm saying that gold has run its course here. It might have a little bit more upside on some craziness tomorrow with Crimea and Russia. I'm still going to take Friday's closing price and say that by next Friday, it's going to close lower. So look for a down move on gold, a little bit of a pullback. Now, I think gold can be a buying opportunity if we get a right good pullback, but it's due for a pullback here. The price level, 133.10. So coming Friday, it must end below 133.10. We're going to stick with long SDS using Friday's close at 29.37. So those are the first three. First three plays, short Facebook, 67.72. That's symbol FB. Short GLD, which is gold, 133.10. As the entry price from Friday and long SDS at 2937. Now the next two plays are going to be based on a specific price getting hit. So bear with me here, guys. Long TZA at 1495, which expires Tuesday at the close. So if TZA, TZA does not hit 1495, $14.95 by Tuesday, then we are going to expire that and cancel it out. It must, for it to be triggered, hit that level by Tuesday's close. With Priceline, I like a long at $1,235. If it hits $1,235, $1,235 by Tuesday at the close or before, it's an entry, but that expires at Tuesday as well. Here's Gareth Soloway with more In the Money, stock market action on AM820 News. All right. Welcome back, everybody. As always, a pleasure to be with you. Second half of the show today. And, uh, you know, again, just an amazing price action week last week. And uh, I think, again, you should be expecting at this stage some more volatility. Remember, Fed meeting Tuesday and Wednesday this coming week, that's the Federal Reserve, will be meeting, and uh, they're expected to taper another $10 billion. So expect the market to get a little jittery, as all, although I think they expect that at this stage of the game. All right, what we're going to do now, folks, is get into the interview. I sat down with a visionary of sorts here. Um, his name, Patrick Burns, CEO of Overstock.com, which is a, you know, a huge, huge publicly traded company, kind of the rival of Amazon.com. And I wanted to talk to him because he's not afraid to speak the truth. And I really admire that. Uh, no matter as crazy as it may seem to the average investor, he actually tells it like it is. And I want to bring to, pe to, to you guys people that do that. So you guys cannot be kind of just covered over and, and you know, we don't want the average public uh, persona or, or thought process to be that kind of placid thought process. It's hard to explain, but bottom line is I don't want you guys to kind of have that kind of normal media interpretation of what's going on. I want you guys to know the truth. So let's get right into this interview today. And again, Patrick Byrne joins us uh, on In the Money Stock Market Action. Today, we're extremely lucky to have a visionary with us, someone who is not afraid to speak the truth about Wall Street or any other shady enterprise. He's the CEO of Overstock.com, and it's my pleasure to welcome Patrick Byrne to In the Money Stock Market Action on 820 AM News Talk Radio. How are you, Mr. Byrne? Gareth, please call me Patrick, and it's an honor for me to be on. Absolutely, Patrick. Thank you so much. And again, you know, one thing, I, I've seen multiple interviews you've done in the past, and one thing that always inspires me is that you're not afraid to speak the truth and just say what's on your mind. And again, I think that's so important in today's day and age. There's so much nonsense going on. Well, thank you. You know, you know, just as a general uh, suggestion for, for it's a life is so much easier if you just speak the truth. I don't view it like I'm getting up every day and going out and picking fights with you. I'm just speaking the truth. You know, there's a lot less to remember. If all you're yeah. going to do is speak the truth, there's a lot less to remember. That is so true. I couldn't agree with that more. And less to remember for sure. But uh, just getting started, I was always curious, and this is just from my personal understanding. You know, could you tell us a little bit how you started Overstock.com? Like, what what inspired you to get it started back in uh, the late 1990s? Well, I was actually working for Mr. Buffett at the time, and I was just about. I was on the edge of retirement. I owned my own. I, my in terms of, you know, our, po our products now are not flea market products. There's, you know, Rolexes and stuff. Absolutely. I, I happen to have bought many, many things from Overstock.com, and it's always been a, a great thing. It's never had an issue, and it's always gotten to me very, very quickly. So uh, return customers the more you, right here. The more you spend, the more you save, Gareth. Don't spend a dollar more than you want to save. Exactly. <laughs> now, you know, just, I was just curious. I was just looking over, you know, I happened to just look over uh, – the overstock.com chart today and you know it seems like it's such a value right there you know if you compare it to someone like amazon.com i mean amazon basically makes almost no money and you guys are continuing to deliver profitable quarters after
after profitable quarters. Um, you know, is, is there anything like, like, I mean, why do you think that Amazon has this valuation as opposed to you guys, which has such a, a good kind of firm valuation, like it's, it's in reality, you know? Well, I, first of all, I'm a total value guy. I grew up in the value school. I've been a value guy since I was 13. So one of the precepts of value investing is you buy a share of stock if and only if you would buy it knowing the market we're going to shut down for 10 years tomorrow. Would you still buy that share of stock? You still want that slice of the company. The corollary is when you run a company, you run it as if there's no public market. So I don't really care. I mean, I don't care personally about this, the stock price. I'm interested in it. I mean, we're just focusing on building a great business, and in the long run, the stock takes care of itself. I have been interested in it in the sense of it has been a window into some shenanigans on Wall Street. Uh, why does Amazon have such a higher valuation? I don't know what they're, you know, they're, uh, I don't know, a dollar of our earnings feels just as heavy as a dollar of their earnings. A dollar of our earnings is, is uh, you know, has a very low PE, and they have some, and what, what is it, 100, 200 P, some, some ridiculous thing. Yeah, so, yeah, we get through for it. And, you know, we, we, two years ago, we earned more money than them in an absolute sense and on a per share basis. Uh, last year, we earned more money than them on a per share basis. If you're a value investor, you're all about, you know, looking for, it's all earnings per share. But uh, I'm, I want to make clear to your listeners, I'm not trying to tell anyone to buy our stock. What they, you know, I never try to pump our stock or tell people. In fact, there have been times I've gone public and I said I think people should stay away from our stock, given some of the characters who had gotten involved on the short side, mm-hmm. who, who yeah. seemed to play have a, a lot of games they could play, and I thought it was kind of risky for a retail investor. But I think now, I think we have a great business opening up. I think we have great earnings per share, and I've actually said publicly my goal is to keep our earnings per share higher than Amazon's. I don't know if it would be that way this year, but I think it can, you know, I, I think that's a reasonable sort of middle, middle term, middle range goal. And so, yeah, it'll be, a t- it'll be interesting if they can, if we can, you know, if our, if we can have higher per share earnings than they do over time, it will at some point, I would think, the market would either have to say they're way overvalued or we're undervalued. And, and you know, the way, I'm sure you know the way to play that is you buy one and short the other, but I'm not recommending either either strategy. Yeah, absolutely. One thing, I mean, just for our listeners, and per, this is just my personal thing, is that, you know, if I if I look at what's the riskier play, would I rather be long uh, Overstock or Amazon, I would rather be long Overstock just because, again, it's got that firm earnings behind it. You know, it's a much lower price point as opposed to Amazon which, you know, in many ways I think is up on hot air, and eventually, you know, you'll have to have a reckoning day where, where the fundamentals, the earnings per share eventually do mean something. So that's, that's a great point there. Um, I was just curious, and I don't know if you can even comment on this, but was, is there ever a, a sense of, of picking up other online retailers to kind of form a bigger alliance against Amazon, or it's like, nah, it's not even worth it, just continue to focus on what you guys do best? Well, you know, we don't uh, – well, in a sense, we are uh, building that alliance because we're providing some back-end services now for uh, – in a way that benefit other websites, and you'll hear, uh, I think, more of them coming down the pike. So in a, in a technological sense, we are in an alliance, uh, although I, I really focus most on – I don't pay nearly as much attention to the competitors as I – I probably should, or certainly, you know, we know our competitors have competitive intelligence functions, and they're always snooping around trying to find stuff out. We don't do that. We just stick to our knitting and try to figure out every day how to do things a little bit better, and if we just keep coming in day by day getting better, leave it to the other guys to try to keep up. But we don't really focus on them. Oh, that's great. Excellent. Um, so now I want to shift gears a little bit, and I kind of want to go towards your views on a few other topics out there. And the first thing, you know, something I, I've talked about to our listeners quite often is, you know, the Federal Reserve and, and them printing this, you know, endless supply of money, $4 trillion in the last five years or so. You know, are you a fan of the Fed? I mean, do you think what the Fed has done has been beneficial? Has it helped the average American or hurt? I mean, what are your thoughts on the Federal Reserve? Well, it is definitely not beneficial to the country. We absolutely should dismantle it. Uh, Milton Friedman was once asked in 1992 in an interview with the Minneapolis branch of the Federal Reserve in their publication, did an interview with them where they said, what's the most important issue facing America? And it's the most important issue facing America is how do we get rid of you, the Federal Reserve? And uh, 
Yeah, they, you know, they, you need a lender of last resort. If you're going to have fractional reserve banking, I think you need a lender of last resort, which was the original mandate of the Federal Reserve. But it greatly expanded that into thinking it could micromanage the economy, and I think that's nuts. Now, I lived in communist China back when it was still communist. I lived there in the early 80s. Uh, I'm very familiar with the Soviet era. And you know, they end up running their societies with a great big set of bureaucrats in a place called, you know, in Soviet case, gas, gas plant or something. That uh, they, the Soviet Union, they were setting 23 million prices by hand. So there wasn't a market system. There was a you had apparatchiks setting prices for every good, 23 million goods in society, right down to the screws that went into the, you know, the casters under the, you know, under the shopping cart or something, and that. That's a silly, you know, we la it's laughable. How would you try to run a society by setting 23 million prices like that? But in our society, the most important price we face is the price at which we discount the future against the present, which is to say interest rates. And what we have is a central planning agency setting those, and that central planning agency is a central bank called the Federal Reserve. It's a horrible institutional design. We shouldn't do it. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. I think it, it ultimately will, I actually think down the line it could be the undoing of the financial system based on everything that they're doing now, but, you know, maybe they have a plan for that. I don't know, you know, but... Um, uh, are they have a plan. The plan's silly. Yeah. They have a plan. Their plan is silly. They, they're dreaming. You know what they're like? You know how there are Wall Street traders? I see that, you, that you're very familiar with Wall Street. You know how there are there's Wall Street traders that have basically blown up different firms by... They're, they do something like they sell long dated out of the money puts and then they book it as income. And that may be a little technical sounding, I'm sure you know what I mean, but they, they can take a bet that pays off nine days out of ten or nine years out of ten. And nine years out of ten you make a million dollars, but then in the tenth year you lose a hundred million dollars. Buffett calls it a business of picking up dimes in front of a steamroller. Well, that's really what the Federal Reserve is doing. They're doing this stuff that, you know, they're, they're not just the QE, but Operation Twist that they've done and the, the taking in the average duration of outstanding treasury instruments has come way down in this administration. What they're doing is they're, they're in a sense, doing something that creates some good results today, but it's building up a bigger and bigger chance of an event, of a bad event, and that event is going to be, is going to wipe out all the, all the, the dimes that they picked up along the way. Someday they're going to hit by the steamroller. I can't believe, I mean, they know this. It's a very reckless strategy. It's an abominably reckless strategy. Yeah, it seems to me like, you know, they're creating every bubble and then they're trying to bail themselves out by doing this and then it just creates another bigger bubble down the line that is going to be more catastrophic and poor, the poor average Americans are getting kind of caught in the middle of it. Yeah, I knew a crackhead who had the same strategy. That's basically their strategy. I'm going to smoke some crack and get high, and then when I come down, I'll oh, I just got to smoke some more, and you got to smoke more and more and more and more. Well, what kind of you know? That's our monetary strategy. I don't even think they have a strategy. I think they've driven down a cul-de-sac. I think there's one guy, Peter Schiffer, says they've driven into the monetary roach motel. There's no exit. Once you start trying to prop up your economy by doing this nonsense, there's no exit. You can't ever get back. You just have to give it bigger and bigger and bigger doses until at some point, you know, reality happens. Yeah, yeah, until you kill the patient, right? Or kill the drug addict. <laughs> yeah, or you have to take them off completely or else, or else the patient dies. And when you do that, the, the withdrawal is far worse than if you had uh, confronted, up, confronted the profligacy up front. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy stuff. Um, now, just going to politicians, you know, I think I think our average listener is kind of always looking for that politician who really speaks the truth, who isn't swayed by the lobbyists and everything. Is there is there anyone out there that that we can look to going forward that you know of? I mean, is there anyone who you get behind and say, you know, he speaks the truth, he's got the right angle on the markets? Well, there's. Uh, let me leave aside the last part of your question. But to the first part of your question, there's anyone who speaks the truth. Yes, first numbers one, two, and three are Ron Paul, Ron Paul, and Ron Paul. Uh, Ron Paul was the only guy who got this or understood rally now as far as the markets go. I don't know. You know, I, uh, I don't think he comments on the markets, but his under understanding the underlying mechanisms. Yeah, it's Ron Paul. These other guys. You know, I don't like making it funny as much as I. <laughs> As strong as my political beliefs are, 
I don't like making anyone's job harder for them. I don't like, I try not to criticize our president too hard. Guy's in a tough spot, don't want to make his job too hard for them. But he just suffers from a bunch of advisors who have a terrible philosophy and worldview. And, but that extends back through George Bush, that extends, you know, I don't know how many decades that ex extends back. But basically, you know, maybe since the creation of the Federal Reserve, none of these guys understand reality other than Ron Paul, Rand Paul, and people of that ilk. Um, what do you think about um, the meteoric rise in like the stock market? I mean, is there? I, I look at the stock market myself, and I talk to our members and, and the listeners and so forth, and I talk about how you know ultimately it's Fed driven, money printing driven, and, and you know artificially keeping interest rates low. But eventually, that merry-go-round must stop. I mean, are, are you when you look at the markets? I mean, do you have that same feeling that eventually we've got to see another large pullback because of what they've been doing? Yes, what they're doing is when you release this many trillions of dollars into the economy, they're once, once again reflating a bubble. You know, we they're trying to tell us we have a recovery. We don't have a recovery, and they're, we've reflated a bubble, and we're calling it a recovery. And what they're trying to generate is a wealth effect. So if you have a 401k with $200,000 in it, and your stocks go it goes way up this year, and you have $400,000, you feel like you made $200,000, and you go and spend 50 of it. That's and that 50 drives this extra economic activity this year, and makes and so that that's how they're pumping things up. But it's a you know it's a, just a terrible strategy, and, it, and it, you know it works well until the day it doesn't. But on the day it stops working, it's there, there'll be something they can't control. And this is actually what they did with housing. I mean, they were with the how they were inflating a housing bubble in part to drive a wealth effect, make people feel wealthy because they're five hundred thousand dollar house went to an eight hundred thousand dollar house and they think oh I spent three hundred thousand dollars I'm gonna go and take a vacation in, in Disneyland and so they can they can stimulate this extra economic activity but it's all phony it's not based on any fundamentals it's just based on them turning on the spigot yeah, and the one thing I always say to to the listeners as well is that, and this is the unfortunate game that's played by Wall Street and by these these Federal Reserve is like how you have the little investor now. I mean, there's so much data showing the little investors pushing all their money in now to the markets, just like they did in '07, and it's just it's just a transfer of wealth. It seems to me where uh, all of a sudden the markets will decline and they lose all their money. They'll sell at the lows, and it's just kind of a, a repeating cycle. I mean, it's just it, it is sad to see that. Yeah, yeah, and at the end of the day, I mean, it's so. I hate to sound like a lefty, but at the end of the day, this is we are turning into an oligarchy. This is how republics die. We have a financial elite that overextends themselves, gets propped up. You know, on on good years they make a ton of money, in bad years they get propped up by a government, and the government is getting that money from you, from your listeners. So effectively, the political economy of it is it's just a big rip off of the American people to make some. You know, some, as Rolling Stone put it, it's some rich bankers bailing out rich bankers on your credit card. All right, guys, I'm just stepping back in here, a little break from the uh, interview. And what we're going to do here briefly is just take a, a quick commercial break. My name is Gareth Soloway, Chief Market Strategist at InTheMoneyStocks.com, and this is In The Money Stock Market Action. Now back to In the Money Stock Market Action on AM820 News. Here's Gareth Soloway. All right, guys, back here as we head towards the close of the show today. Remember, be ready for some continued volatility in the markets. We have the Russia-Crimea situation still going on as the vote apparently is taking place today on whether or not they're going to vote to join Russia. We also have what's going on economically around the globe, including in China, as well as the Federal Reserve um, FOMC policy statement Tuesday, where they're expected to taper another $10 billion. Remember, overall markets should continue to generally head down, but it's not going to be a clean down move. It's going to be bouncy. You're going to have buy the dip mentality. So when you see a big update here and there, don't get swayed. Don't let the emotion of the people on you know, the TV get you on the wrong side of this market. All right, let's get back into the second half of the Patrick Byrne interview. Um, again, folks, we'll touch base in a little while. Here it is. Now, just speaking about um ways to kind of fight back against the printing of money. I know you're, you're a big advocate of Bitcoin and Overstock.com uh, has recently started accepting that payment. I mean, do you think you think Bitcoin will become the wave of the future in terms of the way we all do transactions? I mean, is that where it's headed? 
I think it may. I certainly do not recommend Bitcoin as an investment. I try to make this clear. My admiration of Bitcoin has nothing to do with the the, the valuation or saying you know what kind of investment it is. It's a great medium of exchange. It's such a it's such a better mousetrap. Uh, I would imagine. That is uh, any, anyway. So it's such a better mousetrap. I do anticipate it will at least get adoption, like PayPal, and it may get even more significant adoption. Okay, interesting. And do you think that there's a chance that at some point, if it does get more popular, the government will come in and try to kind of squash it a little bit? I mean, Visa, Mastercard, and Amex obviously have a lot to lose based on the fact that you can get around paying fees. I mean, is there any chance of that, or you think it's something that'll just kind of take its own course and, and become bigger? I think if the government doesn't act soon, it's going to get away from them. And it's not clear to me that the government does want to stop this or or that it's in their interest to stop it. It, it, uh, uh, there, and the government's not monolithic. There are some people who probably hate it and people who are involved in trying to track money launders or something and others who, uh, although it's not, you know, it's not anonymous. It's, they always say it's anonymous, but it's not really. It's pseudonymous, I think it's, it's the word. You have a pseudonym. They can track things back to a pseudonym. Now, they may not be able to track who the pseudonym is, but they can track everything about what that that pseudonym is doing through Bitcoin. So it's not as, you know, people act like it's inevitably entwined with illegal activity, but it really isn't because it's not completely anonymous like cash, for example. Yeah, that's the one thing that, that dawned on me. I love I love the idea of Bitcoin, but it, it does raise the idea that technically every purchase, I mean, if we only used Bitcoin, every purchase would be 100% trackable. You know, it's all becoming uh, that way, and as opposed to going to the bank and getting $100 out of cash and going and spending it at various places where no one technically could say, oh, I see that transaction. So that's interesting. But, you know, if you, if you uh, want to do that and get your $100 in cash, you can do that from an ATM a Bitcoin ATM machine and go spend it. Uh, right now, if you spend money that's not with not ca uh, uh, cash, but it's any kind of credit card, so that's all 100% trackable too. Absolutely. You know, it's tra trackable right to your address. At least with Bitcoin, they you know they can track it to a they can track it to a very long public keychain. Very, but you know they still have to do some additional work to find out who that is. Uh, but so, but if you're really that concerned about not having your stuff tracked, you you, you can't use credit cards anyway. Yeah. So it's at least as good as credit cards, but with a smaller possibility of getting ID theft. That's a great point. That is a fantastic point. Now, do you have any opinion on what's going on in Russia with uh, Ukraine and Crimea? I mean, anything like that? I mean, do you think that's the start of sure. something bigger, or I mean, well, you know, uh, Clausewitz said that war is politics by other means. You know, wars don't just happen. Wars happen from when you've got different powers engaged in political struggles, and eventually they reached some question. Normally, it's in everybody's interest to figure out, well, would we win if we were to fight this war, or would we lose? And if there's a clear answer to that, nobody has to ask to fight. They can just go do whatever the outcome would have been if they did fight, and that's how international politics works. But in we are reaching a point that well uh, so first of all i of course i mean i've i've never all confess i'll confess a bit of a prejudice i uh i've never been a fan of russia right back to the duke of moscovy thousand years ago i think that henry kissinger said that um there's a when when Russia had feudalism and had the first the worst form of feudalism, which is to say serfdom. When it had communism and had the worst form of communism, which is to say Stalinism and Leninism. And when it uh, now that it has capitalism and has the worst form of capitalism, which is to say kleptocracy. It's a uh, it's a horror, and, and that's not incidental. That comes right out of, out of the DNA of the culture of Russia and Russian history, which is more than you probably want me to go into. There's a reason they always make these bad mistakes and that they're just wedded to the strong man view of how you should run a country. So it's a, it's a giant kleptocracy. It's, it's not remarkable to me that they did it. I think this was totally invited by U.S. policy going back to Georgia. I'm surprised it took six years for them to do it. And uh, I think that the U.S. shouldn't go to war. But uh, this, I mean, the, the parallels with the 1930s are so obvious, it's been all to even really talk about them too much. But if we don't, uh, last comment I'll make, Winston Churchill said, an appeaser is one who believes he can convince the crocodile to eat him last. <laughs> That's it.
<laughs> so I don't think we should appease. I think that we should. Uh, there are lots of things we can do. First step is they should be putting the ballistic, uh, the, 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 the missile defense system back in Poland and Czechoslovakia. Just in itself is an enormous black eye for Putin. It would drive him nuts. And we ought to do that is before we even talk to them, we ought to do that. All right, guys, I'm going to just jump in here. There's a little bit more to the interview, but what I would encourage you to do if you want to hear the rest of it is to go to inthemoneystocks.com. That's inthemoneystocks.com, and you can listen into the rest of that interview, really insightful words. And, and what I love, again, about Patrick Byrne is that he just tells it like it is. You know, He's not going to tell you and sugarcoat it or anything else like that. It's just straight up what it comes down to and really the bottom basics of it. And so, you know, it's always about, you know, how many of us do, do we want to keep our head in the sand and just ignore the reality of the situation out there? Or do we want to know the truth so we can make an informed decision on what is going on and how to kind of initiate our own safety precautions? How do we prepare for what may come? And that's what I try to do with the uh, markets for you guys. You know, listen, it's great when you hear all these analysts upgrading the market to new price targets and saying the markets will continue to go up. And, and all right, that's great. That's great. I, w I wish it was the truth. I wish we could all just go to bed and put our money long as much as we can and, and just ride the market and just become richer. But it's not the way it is, you know. It is not the way it is at all. So bottom line is, guys, a lot to look forward to this week. We have, again, the Fed meeting. We have the Russia-Crimea situation. We have everything else that I've discussed. Remember, our plays for this week are going to be spectacular. Let's make some more money. Don't forget to donate. My name is Gareth Soloway, Chief Market Strategist at InTheMoneyStocks.com, and this is In The Money Stock Market Action on 820 AM News Talk Radio.